Alright, so we come to the second part of modern philosophy, classical philosophers and philosophies part two. Remember to keep in mind that when we mean by classical philosophers, we don't mean classical as in the time period of Greek or Romans, but we mean classical as in they're really popular in the modern period and that every, almost everybody knows about it, that kind of classical kind of philosophy. So with that in mind, let's move on. So the perhaps the most influential person of modern philosophy would be John Locke. John Locke was a person that dealt with both epistemology and metaphysics kind of and political philosophy so we're going to talk about the epistemology first so john locke talked about the theory of knowledge right how do we get to know things and he argued that how we get to know things that we can only know things by mostly by experience he <clears throat> he argued that for different things there's qualities that make up things for example the primary qualities are qualities that cannot be changed or are definitely objective and that cannot possibly be disputed for example something is this long or this thick or this size, shape, that can't possibly be denied because there's an objective scale of measurement according to John Locke. Secondary qualities are qualities that can be denied. For example, color. One might say it's red, but if you put it in a different right, it might appear blue. Because some people might say that this object is hard, but other people who grew up in harder environment might say that the object is actually soft and those kind of stuff. So he argued that secondary qualities are absolutely necessary in perception of an object, while primary colors qualities can give you the basic ideas and whatnots of the object secondary qualities are necessary to describe the object for example you could say apple you could say orv you could say a certain size certain weight whatever but you still won't have an idea on ample until uh, apple until you describe the taste size color and those kind of stuff so john locke argued that those kind of secondary qualities which are absolutely necessary in those objects can be only known by experience. We can't possibly measure those colors or shapes or size, at least at this time. And those are definitely subjective. So his branch of philosophy is called empiricism, which means knowledge by experience. He argued that everything was called the tevula rosa. You probably heard this before. This means the blank state. Everybody is born with a blank mind. There's nothing written on it and the only way people can form ideas or thoughts is by looking at the blank mind the tabula rosa and the only way to gain knowledge in this fact would be by experience so that's his idea of epistemology so his idea of political philosophy was slightly more influential he argued that the state of nature was a good state it's a, it's a contrast to hobbes and rousseau who argued that a state of nature was a dangerous state for the state of man he argued that the nature was actually a good state when people respected each other's rights each other's property according to rights liberty life and property and then they kept and respected each other because as we all know we're human beings right but we have to form governments to regulate the rights of the human beings what we mean is this we all want to respect the rights of people, for example, freedom. But if we don't know exactly the standards of freedom or how to enforce it, if some people decide to ruin it, that's not going to be good enforcement. So he argued that governments are formed and people agree to form governments in order to keep up the rights of the people. It's not like Hobbes who argued that they necessarily submit to a sovereign or Rousseau who argued that the good of the public should be priced over the individual. John Locke argued that individuals agree to be in a government if and only if his rights are to be respected. That's natural, but the point of the government then, if you follow Locke's argument, is that the governments are instituted for the sake of the rights of the people. He argued that the role of government should be restricted to those rights of the people. Of course, you probably know that he influenced a lot of revolutions, including the American Revolution, French Revolution. But his major idea wasn't that the governments are built for governments are built for those rights the government his idea was that the government's function itself was to help the rights it doesn't matter how the government was instituted the idea the classic idea of the social contract was that the people agreed to be in a government only to form those respect other people's right and get to develop it his ideas spread, influenced other people like russo later on while well, russo takes a different view now, if we follow along the metaphysical path of empiricism, we come to George Berkeley. Now, George Berkeley had three matters in mind. He said three, only three things exist. Mind, matter, the world, and God is a given thing. So, Berkeley argued that existence could only be possible from perception. Since we only perceive qualities, what's going on is that every... Since you only perceive qualities... Berkeley argued that first primary qualities in Locke's work did not exist. For example, hardness or length of those things, Berkeley argued, were also subjective. We could say 
a ruler is long, this certain long, 15 centimeters long, but according to Berkeley, that centimeter itself was a subjective measure. You could say inches or foot or whatnot, and you could say it's long or short. One foot might not feel as long as, let's say, like 500 millimeters or whatnot. And he argued that those were subjective matters. He gives interesting arguments for qualities itself. For example, hot and cold cannot exist. If you put your hand in hot water and you put another hand in cold water and you put into the water at the same time, what happens is that your hands, one of your hands feels really hot, the other hand feels really cold. So obviously heat cannot possibly be a subjective matter. In the same way, everything we perceive must be a secondary quality. It must be subjective. Even sound itself must be subjective. When we hear things, there's loudness or softness that we discern itself. While there are vibrations of molecules, our perceptions of those itself are subjective to those qualities. So obviously what we have to do, what we have to know is that according to Berkeley, everything, everything was subjective. So basically things could not exist if people did not perceive it because every quality that it consisted of was subjectivity. So then the problem goes, if there's a chair in an empty courtyard where no one perceives the chair, is it possible to perceive the chair? Is it, is it possible to perceive the chair? No, because that's given. So can we say that the chair exists? If you follow Berkeley, we have to say that the chair cannot exist because no one's perceiving it. But, but Berkeley came up with a solution to that problem, which was that God perceived everything. Now, this might seem a little far-fetched or unrealistic to most people, as Hume would later argue, but what we have to know about Berkeley's philosophy was that his idea was based upon the idea of God. The intelligent being was being used to, inf to explain events that weren't determined at the time, that were unknowable by human knowledge, so they could only argue that an intelligent being, a higher, more powerful being, was ordering everything. So, if you follow Berkeley, we have to say everything exists because of perception of God. And that everything is subjective it exists in the own mind his ideas don't get enough recognition in the world in either the popular society or the philosophical society but his idea were an important contribution to empiricism so david hume was perhaps the most under-respected empiricist of this time if to give a little knowledge about his personal history david hume formed a relationship with rousseau which they broke up after a violent fight but because the public loved rousseau hume was belittled and his ideas weren't really popular until after his death so it's easy to see hume as a continuer of empiricism Locke said there were primary and secondary qualities so he talked about subjectivity Berkeley said that everything was subjective, so he got rid of the primary quality. Now, David Hume could be seen as getting rid of the self, the perception of self, by saying that everything is just perceptions itself. But we can't see it that way because Hume's ideas itself are probably unique in this world. So Hume was so influential, his book, in The Inquiry into Human Understanding, was said to awaken Kant from his dogmatic slumbers. It's a pretty well-written phrase. So... Hume's major idea in this first book, which was published under an anonymous name, was that he said that the self was also a perception. Remember that Descartes argued that the only way people can know that anything exists is by looking at the self itself. If we know that we are a thinking being, as Descartes says, then we would know at least that fact exists outside of everything. But Hume argued that that's impossible. According to him, the self could not be anything but by actions. For example, when we say, yourself what do you say you're doing you say we're listening or we're learning or we're doing something that we can only describe ourselves not as a being who's who's consisting of certain qualities but a being who is only doing things into action so what this what the implications of this is that it's impossible to describe a self except as some action at that point we can't be dissimilar to other objects for example if we say a watch we say a watch is something that keeps time in that case we could say a human is something that thinks and that doesn't differentiate from the watch because they're both actions you could argue that there's a will that directs the actions but again that's an action itself that thinking we are thinking is a uh, connection itself his this idea was discarded in later human philosophy but it is still an important contribution in the fact that it did raise a heck of a lot of controversy in the philosophical world so his second most major idea was the relation between movements and senses. He argued basically that everything did not have a necessary connection. Basically, this is the fact. People like Descartes and the Cartesian school argued that we can only know things by looking at things subjectively and analyzing the little facts that we get from innate ideas. But Hume argued this. It's impossible to know something 
by innate ideas. For example, if there's two billiard balls on the table and you hit the one with the other, just by looking at that hitting motion without knowing the cause and effect, is it possible to analyze, to logically prove that the billiard ball will move a certain way? It's not, it's not possible. We can argue that since it always did that, it would move in a certain way, but that's only because of its experience. There's a cause, the billiard ball hitting the other one, and the effect could be anything. It could fly up, it could shoot down. We can't possibly know, even if we analyze the basic material of those causes, because according to Hume, we can't know the underlying power that operates the universe. So according to Hume, we only know about constant conjunctions, that everything's based on experience, because it's impossible to analyze the water, impossible to analyze anything. For example, Adam was the first man on the earth, but when he saw water, could he analyze just by looking at the qualities of the water that if he went in there, it would drown him? The answer is no. Why? Because he must experience it. He must feel the suffocation. He must understand by experience that everything would be, and that something would go wrong if they tried to breathe in the water. In that case, everything must be based on subjectivity because it is based on experience.